and welcome everyone to this week's Maternity Midwifery Hour. It's week two, series 12. I can almost not believe I'm saying this. My name's Sue MacDonald and I'm the curator for Maternity Midwifery Hour and the Maternity Midwifery Festivals. And it's my honour to be chairing this evening's session, which is going to be kind of a little bit different because it's an international focus. You'll notice our international speakers are very busy and that we have to work with different time zones and the different time we can get them for. So I'm really delighted to be joined by Jackie Dunkley-Bent, our Chief Midwife at the International Confederation of Midwives. And because we always do this to our guests, I have to put her on the spot and ask her to share a moment of the week. And it really is putting her on the spot. So sorry, Jackie, for that. Hello. Oh, um, well, thank you, uh, Sue. It's, it's always an absolute pleasure to join you on this uh, fantastic platform that just goes across the globe. I often think of tentacles in every single Ooh. part of the world. Um, yeah, absolutely. Ooh. Every single country, midwives that don't have an opportunity sometimes to engage in rich narrative like this have an opportunity to, to join. So I'm always very supportive of this platform but but my moment of the week I think I was stalling for time there but my moment <laughs> of the week I think um um I I've been minded this week of the fact that I have the privilege of uh walking to work from home to work in seven minutes throughout my entire career I've never ever been able close enough to work to walk to work to walk to work so you know, I um I just had a moment of reflection this week that this is a really good thing. And um yeah, so I'm sorry it couldn't have been any more exciting than that, but that was my moment. But that well, that could be very exciting, depending on what you see on your seven minute walk. And that means you can't cheat and get in a car or any <laughs> other vehicle, and it's very healthy. And probably a very good time for reflection. Actually, you did use the word reflection. And that's I know that's a very important part of what you get up to, Jackie. So fabulous. Well, I'm just going to do a little quick overview. And I was, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about little snowdrops because that's probably my moment of the week. And I don't usually get to share a moment of the week. But I saw some little tiny snowdrops coming through. And that's always a harbinger of spring and that, that makes me feel better so that's my little moment of the week but anyway first before we go on to in, encouraging Jackie to share what her presentation I'm just going to remind everybody who is here who always comes here every Wednesday and those of you who are new where the maternity and midwifery hour came from which was from the very beginning of the pandemic and that was from the lockdown in March 2020 where we really could see midwives needed and student midwives and all of those people in, in maternity services actually needed information, especially about COVID-19 and what was happening in the maternity services at that time and in the health services, but also information generally and connection. And we started the maternity hour because of that and we've gone on. And of course, we're now in that coming into our fourth year, which I can, can hardly believe really. Um, and obviously, we're not looking at COVID so much now. We're looking much more at maternity care and maternity services, midwives, what midwives get up to their education, um, all sorts of things within in within this hour. And I would just want to remind people, everything we do is recorded. So if you miss anything or you watch this and you enjoy it, which I hope you will, you might think, oh, there must be more like that. And there is. And if you look under Matflix, and that's on the resources sheet that's with this um, hour, you'll see the link and you can go in and check out what is available. And there's a masses and masses of presentations and information, which is useful if you're doing a dissertation or an assignment, any studies at all, or if you just want to update yourself if you've got a revalidation due. Very, very useful for that because it it's a very comfortable way of, of learning new things and challenging yourself. And Because I think, especially when it's new research or new practice, seeing the people who are involved talking makes it really come alive. So do have a look at that when you can. Also, I want to say a big 
Thank you to everybody who's working so hard in the maternity services, wherever you are in the world, and especially within the UK. Hard times in the winter because it's busier, more people are off sick, and everyone has to work that bit harder, and everyone's working really hard anyway. So I'll just remind you, look after yourselves the way you look after your women and babies, because you are really important to the service, as well as to your family and your friends. So that's my my big thank you for now. Now, I don't have a huge amount of news, and I was encouraged by a colleague to say that yesterday was the, I think it was the National Sticky Toffee Pudding Day. Can you believe it? There would be a day for a sticky toffee pudding. On more serious notes, today is Education Day, International um, Education Day, and it does remind me, and I'd already put a lot, lot of resources on the resources sheet, the International Confederation of Midwives, and I'm not just saying that because Jackie's here in the background, have some fantastic resources. And if you haven't ever access them use this as an opportunity to do so there's, there's some fantastic competence competencies for midwives and for education that they're, they're just all the resources you will get lost in the page going through because you'll want to read and copy everything but just before you copy everything on your printer just check how many pages it is just in case you're running out of ink or something there's still an issue and i have to highlight this with measles outbreak in the uk so if you know anybody that needs to be vaccinated, just check around whether that's going on well. Again, on the resources sheet, there is a link to the NHS measles vaccination hub, which is really useful. So you've got information to share with women, your families and your own family and friends, obviously. Um, and we're also going to raise the RCM are doing a research project. 20, so 10 top priority issues for midwifery research. And that link is also on the resources page. We also have two colleagues coming to the next festival who will be sharing that whole project. So that'll be really interesting too. So that's in February. Oh, so this week, we're looking at midwifery and maternity services in the world. And we're starting with Jackie Dunkley-Bent. Oh, I'm delighted to welcome this evening She's Professor Jacqueline Dunkley-Bent, OBE, the first chief midwife for the International Confederation of Midwives. And she was the first chief midwife in England also and was with us for not long enough, I'd say, not long enough, but she's, she's doing even better things at the ICM. She's held so many different roles in midwifery. She's been a senior lecturer. She's been a clinical midwife. She's been a consultant midwife, a, a, a Director of Midwifery, as well as the Chief Midwife for NHS England. She's re a, a real leader in midwifery, much loved and much esteemed. I haven't ever heard any anyone say anything negative about Jackie, and I can understand that. She's And she's really raised the midwifery profile and supported hugely continuity of care and quality of care for mothers and babies, especially in England, but now obviously all over the world so welcome Jackie thank you so much for coming this evening the screen will be yours shortly and in fact it is now great um well thank you so much Sue um uh for that um introduction and I, I'm as I said I'm delighted to be here I, I feel very privileged actually to be a part of an amazing profession the profession of midwifery and I I'm proud to call myself midwife. And every time I am with a group of midwives or visiting a country, I feel even more proud that wherever you go in the globe, you can always find a midwife. And what connects us is our, dare I say, our midwifery DNA. Um, but I'm going to share with you all those that are listening um, across the globe and those that are listening um, from uh, work, um, traveling, uh, in there, there, wherever you are, I'm going to share a little about the ICM. Sue mentioned that I uh, served as the uh, Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England, and I served for four years. And so I'm now here um, at the International Confederation of Midwives. So hopefully I, you can see my screen. I'm just going to go on to uh, slideshow. 
and take this from the beginning, uh, right from the beginning. <laughs> okay, so I think I've shared previously, it's, it's one of my strap lines that I frequently use, that what we do as midwives will ripple through generations. So wherever you are, uh, feel proud that your contribution matters and what you do will impact on people when they're older, when they're later in life, and indeed their children and their children's children. So the impact will ripple through generations. But for now, I'm frequently asked, who is the ICM, particularly for midwives in the UK? Uh, who are they? Where are they? Where are you going? Are you going to ICM? And they refer to ICM as Congress. ICM is not Congress. <laughs> we host a Congress every three years. So uh, what is the ICM? Just a little bit about that uh, before I go on to um, other things. Just to let you know that the ICM has been around for now 102 years, celebrating its 102nd birthday this year. It supports and represents and works to strengthen professional associations. And some people might not be familiar with that. In the UK, you have the Royal College of Midwives, the RCM. That's in a professional association. Other In other parts of the world, uh, they're referred to as colleges or societies. We refer to them, um, and this is how we describe these organisations, as professional midwife associations. And so there are 140 member associations because there are members. They're the ICM, the International Confederation of Midwives members. So we work through our 140 member associations, be that uh, called a college or a, a, a royal college or a, an, an association or a society. And what's really exciting for me is the member associations, this represents 119 countries across every continent. So we have uh, a reach and impact in every continent across the world. And together, we represent over 1 million midwives globally. And, and that is, um, I think, a huge responsibility that we take really seriously because every midwife matters. Every midwife right now that is in a country, um, in a rural part of the country where there is nobody, nobody but a midwife to support women who may well be, um, have a uh, low risk um, and other women that might have complex care needs and who have they got? They have a midwife, a midwife that is trained and educated, hopefully. So, you know, as I say, what we do ripples through generations and it's really important for the ICM that we have midwives, all the midwives across the world who are educated and regulated and working in established health system so that they can affect the best care, support the best outcomes for mums and babies. But, you know, this is about our global uh, representation. And I have a vision, of course I do, we all have a vision, but this is tied into somewhat the vision of the ICM, the International Confederation of Midwives, but also my own personal vision. So the vision from the ICM is every childbearing woman has access to a midwife's care for herself and her newborn. That's not a difficult ask, but actually it is. It is. We have over a million midwives, but we need so many, so many more, so many more that are equipped to be able to do their jobs well. And I really must emphasize that. Um, but I see a future. I see a future where all women and babies have the same maternity outcomes and experiences as those who have the best, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic status. You've heard me say this before, and I will never tire of saying this. All women and babies have the same maternity outcomes and experiences as those who have the best. And to achieve that, we need to pull together. We need to be bold and courageous and say the things that people don't want to hear. And I'm gonna say some of those things as we canter through this presentation. 
I see a future where women and babies are prioritised and protected to receive safe midwifery and maternity care at times of humanitarian and climate crisis. This is an emerging situation and it isn't getting any better. And I might be able to share a little bit more about that as, as, as we progress. But we need to ensure that mums and babies are prioritised because at times of humanitarian crises, climate crises, they're the ones that I believe do not receive the care and attention that they need, need for survival. We need the generations to continue. I see a future where every day in 2020, approximately 800 women died from preventable causes. 800 women, 800 women every day, meaning that a woman dies every two minutes. And I see a future where this is a thing of the past. You, you, you couldn't fathom that data, could you? 800 women a day? These are global estimations, of course. I see a future where we have a reachable target for the sustainable development goals so that the, the ambition is to reduce maternal mortality to less than 70 maternal death. And we know that in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the maternal mortality rate is 1,100 uh, um, 1, per 100,000 live births versus um, some high-income countries where the maternal mortality rate is 11, 12. I still, however, say that one death, one death, one preventable death is one too many. But we need to have a future. I see a future where this sustainable development goal is reached and surpassed. We can surpass this, but we need collective action. I see a future where almost two million babies born every year uh, are still born every year or one every 16 seconds is a thing of the past. We want this to be a thing of the past, a future where one's chances of being stillborn or dying giving birth is not determined by the fact that the birth has taken place in a low or middle income country. Totally unacceptable, but that is a reality today. A future where our ambition to end preventable maternal mortality by 2030 will be met. A future where stillbirth rates for high and low income countries are not higher in rural areas. And I'm now thinking about the UK and socioeconomically disadvantaged and those from ethnic minority backgrounds are in these rural areas and are um, greatly affected because there's a, there's a disparity in health outcomes and a future where midwives, midwives have an automatic seat at the table, at government table, at the ministry's table for planning, development and um, guidance about sexual, reproductive, maternal and newborn health plans. So, of course, I know you see a future where all these things will happen too, but we need concerted effort to make these things a reality. And the reason why is because we have evidence that shows us that uh, midwives are educated and regulated to ICMs, so um, the International Confederation Midwife Standards, and integrated into a well-established um, well health system providing family planning care, can, and look at the can, 87% of essential care can be provided. We can avert more than 50% of maternal deaths, stillbirths, neonatal deaths, improve over 50 other related outcomes. You can see them there on the screen, that there are so many um, outcomes in association with having midwives educated and regulated to ICM standards. We have global standards. That's pretty unique for an organisation but we have them and we know that we have the formula for improving health outcomes. If only we had every country signed up in a way that this was established and sustained. There's no point in putting it in and then taking it out four years later, two years later, one year later. And this is about preventing stillbirths. So maternal death, etc. So we have the formula, midwives educated and regulated to ICM standards and integrated into a well-functioning, a well-functioning health system. And we believe, we believe that if every country implemented 
the ICM professional framework, then they would, every country who implemented this in a sustainable way would have high quality um, midwifery care, midwives providing high quality care. So let me just talk you through um, this uh, uh, framework. This is the professions framework, the midwifery professions framework. Um, we have a philosophy, of course we do, because um, in the absence of a philosophy, we lose our direction. But at the core of the philosophy, we have essential competencies. And the essential competencies are used by midwifery regulators um, as a measure of competence when um, midwives are registered and entering into practice. So the essential competencies are really significant and underpin everything that we do for practice. And then of course, we have a re evidence-based practice research. We have research that informs the way we work and we have so much research that suggests that if you have a midwife, you can improve a midwife that's educated and regulated to ICM standards. You can have high quality care by a midwife, which has an association with improving outcomes. We know the narrative about continuity of midwife care. And we know that you can only implement a model like that if you have midwives that are educated, regulated, have a cadre of midwives that is associated with safe care, and you have midwives that are um, uh, supported to work in a continuity way, in a sustainable way. Education, we have education standards at the ICM, so midwives must be trained um, using those education standards, of course, regulation, regulation protects the public and also safeguards the profession, safeguards the midwife. The associations, I've talked about the midwives associations and how we work through mid midwife associations to help the ICM to achieve that ambition of having a midwife for every woman, a midwife that's educated, regulated and working within an established health system. I'll never tire of saying those things. It's not just good enough to have a midwife. We must have a midwife that is educated, regulated, and working within an established health system and educated to ICM competencies. And then, of course, leadership. Where would we be without leadership if we haven't got a leader that will guide, support, and help us to achieve these things? Then we won't make very much progress. A leader that's advocating with the profession a leader that's having conversations with health system leaders, with policy makers, with ministries, with governments, being bold and courageous to advocate for the profession, showing our, uh, our um, uh, decision makers, our system leaders, that look at this evidence, look at the correlation between high quality care and a midwife that's educated and regulated to ICM standards working within an established health system. Look at the correlation, look what happens. You will have high quality care from midwives, which can only impact on saving lives and improving outcomes. And of course, we don't stop there. We must, of course, have an enabling environment, an enabling environment where midwives are supported to work to their potential, supported to do the things that they've been trained to do, um, being valued, being respected, being invested in, um, having enough support around them to do their jobs well, having kit that's ready to be used, having kit that's safe to be used, having um, enough resource to be able to do their jobs well, and also having an MDT team, a multidisciplinary team, multi-agency team that they can refer women too. This is about working collaboratively with obstetricians, neonatologists and other support staff. Really, really important. So um, an enabling environment. And then lastly, we don't stop there because lastly, we must ensure that we have gender equality and um, equality and diversity that underpins so that we have equality in everything that we do so significant and important. And the data shows us why we need to have gender equality, why we need to have equality and diversity. 
And around the side of this um, uh, um, uh, framework are just some of the things that we're doing at the ICM to make this framework come alive. And what I will say, and I'm taking a little bit of time on this, but I think it's really important. If one element of this framework is not delivered, it will weaken the other elements of the framework. So if you're expecting high quality care by implementing one element, it won't work. They are in, inextricably linked. When one area is weakened, the other area is weakened. If you've got weak leadership, you won't get the evidence-based research um, into uh, practice, into the hearts and minds of system leaders, policy leaders to affect change. If you don't have associations that are supporting and driving this action, then um, we won't get very far with our narrative. If we haven't got regulation, then we won't be able to safeguard the profession and the public and so on. So these are inextricably linked. And this is the model. This is the profession's model that we are speaking to um, all our countries through our associations and um, indeed to our system leaders and governments too. And the reason why I'm so passionate about that um, uh, uh, framework, our framework, our profession's framework, is because we know that there's an association between achieving universal coverage of midwife-delivered interventions and saving lives. So if we look at by 2035, 4.3 million lives per year could be saved. If we're less ambitious and we take this down to 25% increase in coverage of midwife delivered interventions every five years, circa 2.2 million lives, and even a modest increase would um, affect a 1.3 million lives per year by 2035. And so absolutely, there is evidence to show an association, an association between high quality care from a midwife and improving outcomes for mums and babies. This is about the next generation. It's a no brainer. We need people to hear this because this is about saving lives. But I predicate all of this by saying a midwife that is educated and trained to ICM standards working within an established health system. So um, I'm going to stop there. And I just want to thank you all for all you do for all you care for, and thank you for all you do for each other and the profession. I believe that together we can, but we need to be bold and courageous. And in some parts of the globe, people aren't doing so well because they haven't got the infrastructure. In some parts of the globe, uh, midwives aren't being listened to or sidelined, and the evidence is ignored. Collective action is what we need bold, courageous leaders, and of course, your good selves to affect change. Why? Because we believe in improving outcomes and saving lives. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jackie. I think that, and I think the, the point that stays with me is your point about each part of the framework being important and being whole. Because you can see as, as the sort of, for example, the gender inequality, which is present in a lot of parts of the world, hampers the whole framework. And that, that I think you put that so beautifully. Now, I know we've got a very precious few minutes with Jackie because she's got to rush off mm -hmm. as a chief midwife. She's a very busy person, but we have had a few comments and questions. So if we can throw them at Jackie, I'm sure she'll answer them. We've had a comment from Diane Garland. Hi, Diane, who says she's so glad you've ignited con continuity of care because many continuity of care, continuity of care projects have been halted due to staffing and recent reports into some issues in certain midwifery units in the UK. Now, that's just UK. Um, and I'm not sure how that hits the rest of the world and how how much continuity of, of care is present in the rest of the world. And uh, in uh, fact, uh, in fact, actually, sorry, Jackie, uh -huh. patients, um, Guy Mepeth, no, Guy Mepe, nay uh -huh. pounds, 
Hi, Patience. And, and she says, hi, Jacqueline, thank you for this amazing presentation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you for mentioning continuity of care. Where do you see the future of continuity of care globally? That links beautifully with Diane's point. Do you think the model of care is achievable in every country? Just a little question. Just a little one. <laughs> and I would say, I would say the only way to affect change and I, if I look back over my 30 plus year career, the only way to affect change in a sustainable way is to have good foundations. And good foundations mean that, number one, people need to understand the evidence. People need to know what the evidence means to women's lives, to their health, to the health of their babies. And then, of course, we need to have an infrastructure, that enabling environment that I talked about with the um the professions framework without an enabling environment that is infrastructure, safe staffing, educated staff, staff that understand what they're doing in a continuity model and want to work in that way. Then once we've got the foundation set, then we can set about building continuity of care. In the absence of any one of those, we will be challenged with um, how continuity is developed and how sustainable it is. So I do believe in the building blocks that need to be in place. Across the globe, we have so many challenges. We have midwives that um, aren't regulated. Uh, we have midwives that aren't trained to ICM competencies. We have midwives that are working in the absence of anybody but themselves, um, uh, um, supporting women with complex care needs, we have uh, uh, midwives that are having to deal with life and death situations every single day. And there isn't a buzzer to pull. What they have is their skill and themselves. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I could go on about that. Some of the things that I've seen, experienced and, and, and have been told. But nonetheless, uh, this is why the profession's framework is so important to embed in a sustainable way. And then we move on from there. But we don't have sight of the models of care that really make a difference to women's experiences and health outcomes. No, that's fantastic. I think, I mean, I think your point about that not having buses all over the world, we're, I mean, we're very privileged. And I think working together it's one that's what and I, I think that's why when people ask you about the ICM they think congress mm -hmm. because that's a wonderful experience for any midwife to really be with a sisterhood mm -hmm. and a few brotherhoods there's quite a few brothers <laughs> as well and together to support each other and I think it's really important that we do so thank you for that and now I've got um Emma McDowell this might almost be the last question. And uh, does Jacqueline have any thoughts on how this kind of high quality care could be impact perinatal mental health? Notice postpartum depression mentioned on previous slide. Good question, Emma. Absolutely a really good question. And of course, um, high quality care. If we have high quality care, we have appropriate time for antenatal appointments, um, antenatal consultations. And dare I even press into the pre-pregnancy space, you know, that infrastructure that um, is somewhat lacking in many parts of the globe. But just time to listen, time to have a relationship, to build a relationship over, a, over the pregnancy. We know the evidence says that women are more likely to disclose their mental health challenges. You know, and, and it's a no brainer, I think. If I was sat in front of a stranger and then I saw somebody else at another appointment and somebody else at another appointment, or indeed somebody that was shuffling paper or had a relationship with a computer and just <laughs> looked at me occasionally, I'm not okay. quite sure whether I'd share anything about my personal self. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I know we know this. And I knew this when I qualified as a midwife some 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago. And yet here we are today. Um, uh, having to have these conversations. Um, but I do believe our appointment slots, I know this isn't popular, what I'm going to say now, but our <laughs> appointment slots for antenatal care are very, very reduced. And we have to do more and more as midwives in a 15 minute, some 10 minutes, some 20 minutes, if we're lucky, antenatal appointment slots. 
And, um, you know, we're dealing with people, you know, mm. people that want a relation. People are looking at you at the most special time for most people, the most special time in their lives. And they want that eye contact. They want mm. that I am interested in you. I am invested in you, not the opposite. So we have much to do in relation to mental health too. Absolutely. I think and also you, as you're talking about the appointments, it's very much putting yourself and what would you want? Would you want five minutes with someone looking at the computer? Would you like somebody who's actually keying into what you're saying? No, that's fantastic. I've got now I've got one more comment, I think, uh, from Laura Dana Zordan. Hi, Laura Dana, who says, thank you for the presentation. I'm a midwife from Italy. I know Jackie when she was a consultant midwife. <laughs> uh, Italy does not unfortunately belong anymore to the ICM. What can I what can I do to be an independent ICM member? Oh, that's really, really unfortunate. And hello, Gosh. and um we we would have had a great time if if I if I knew you around the time of when I was a consultant <laughs> midwife um in Lambert Southwark and Lewisham in down in London. But um I don't I'm not quite sure. Maybe your uh, midwives association in Italy is no longer a member and um, we work through um, midwives associations so uh, you might ask a question where is the midwives association what has happened that means that they're no longer a member of the ICM and you might want to um, uh, have a conversation to support them to become a member or indeed mm -hmm. if that doesn't work I'm more than happy for you to reach out to the IC, reach out to me, reach out to the ICM, go on the website, get our, 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 our membership email, and we can support you to support your association that is no longer a member. Wow. Well, we need to be over a million then. Uh, I love that the, 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 I love some of the stats that you were using, Jackie, especially when we said 119 countries and a million midwives. Not enough. But a million midwives, that's a fantastic, that's going to stay in my, my brain and my heart. So thank you so much for joining us on behalf of everyone who's watching. I'm sorry, that's all you get from Jackie because she's <laughs> got to rush off now. But thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you to um, everybody. Oh, no, no I, I can't. I can't nobble you with another question. That'll have to wait, I think, for another another time. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Sue, and thank you for all you do here. It's fantastic, for, particularly for midwives across the globe. Thank you. Thank and you. Good night. Thank you. Night, night, Jackie. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. So, as I said right at the beginning, it is difficult because um, obviously, when we're inviting international people, their time scales are different, and this is a, a very good example um, of of having Joy Kemp, who we had on for a short time at Christmas at the Christmas session, um, and Joy has sent a recording. She was very keen to share a recording of her work in Bangladesh. Now, Joy Kemp, I'm going to introduce her while in the background, um, Angelo is setting up the, the, the video clip, but I'll just start off with an introduction. And Joy Kemp is a midwife who's working in Bangladesh. And many of you will know Joy because she was uh, a midwifery lecturer and then she was at the Royal College of Midwives for a long time. Very experienced midwife educator. Um, and she's a very much a midwife, midwife, a midwife, and very keen on education. We've been using education a lot. And it's very fitting because it's education day. So that's great. Um, and we're just having had Joy speak before Christmas. We wanted to just add a little bit more information about the project work that she's doing in Bangladesh. And so Joy was very happy to send us a recording. So welcome to Joy. And I'm hoping in the background, Angelo, who looks like he's looking after all the production and making sure everything's recorded beautifully, is able to key in the um the video clip so angelo is is joy with us now and yes she is fabulous
Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to have been invited to join in this evening's maternity and midwifery hour once again. Um, I contributed a short piece to the Christmas special at the end of last year. Um, my name is Joy Kemp. I am an international midwife specialist in Bangladesh, and I've recorded this session ahead of time due to the six hour time difference, meaning that when you listen to it, it will be the middle of the night for me. So I'm very sorry not to be joining live. I'm just going to show my slides. And I hope you can see those clearly. So for those who weren't able to uh, join the previous session, I'll briefly explain that our organisation is helping the government of Bangladesh to introduce midwifery as a profession separate from nursing. And I've been working in Bangladesh since 2016, but I've only been living here full time since July last year when I joined our organisation. Prior to that, I was working with the Royal College of Midwives in the UK as their global professional advisor leading their international partnerships, including the work in Bangladesh. And you'll hear more about that later. Um, here I am, a picture just taken last week with my national colleague and counterpart, Pranita Raha. It's an honor and a privilege to be sharing this session with Jacqueline, the International Confederation of Midwives Chief Midwife, as our organisation works globally with our ICM, both at a macro level, but also in its focus countries, of which Bangladesh is one. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the ICM's professional midwifery framework, which sets out 10 core elements that are fundamental to a strong midwifery profession. One of these in green on this diagram is professional midwives associations. <clears throat> associations are absolutely vital for connecting and supporting midwives, bringing them together in collective voice, both in their own countries, but also globally. Strengthening midwives, of course, is, is a core part of ICM's role, but it's also a key element of my organization's midwifery strategy, and that's the focus of our partnership in Bangladesh with the International Confederation of Midwives. It's also been the focus of my work for the last 10 years. I am a self-confessed midwifery association nerd, and I'm happy to talk about strengthening the capacity of midwives associations um, at any time. Please do, do get in touch. The Professional Midwives Association in Bangladesh is known as the Bangladesh Midwifery Society and it was founded in 2010 by nurses. Those nurses were pioneers. They had a vision for reducing maternal mortality and achieving gender equity in Bangladesh through the introduction of midwifery as a profession separate from nursing. Halima standing next to me in the photo at the bottom of this slide was the founding president and Montaz standing next to Halima was the second president and I was privileged to work very closely with both of those remarkable women. Midwifery education in Bangladesh just started 10 or so years ago and the first midwife graduated in 2016 with the first midwives entering the government workforce in 2018. But at that time, there was no space within the constitution of the Bangladesh Midwifery Society for the new generation of midwives to be members or to take on leadership roles within their own association. And so the Royal College of midwives was invited by our organization to form a partnership with the Bangladesh Midwifery Society to help to develop its organizational capacity and to help it transition 
from a nurse-led to a midwife-led organisation and I was privileged to lead that work. That partnership finished in 2022 and was evaluated and presented at the ICM's 2023 Congress in Bali and this is the poster from that uh, evaluation. Now, I've enlarged the box on the results which I hope you can see clearly and the evaluation showed that the partnership had been a good fit with both national and regional priorities, had achieved its objectives, had adapted innovatively to COVID-19 and had helped both the RCM and BMS to achieve their strategic goals. The partnership had also been a an important enabler in the professionalization of midwifery in Bangladesh and had contributed to gender equity. It hadn't set out to do this, but it also had in a small way improved the quality of midwifery care. And I don't have time to go into that now, but I'm very happy to talk about that to anyone who has an interest. The evaluation did also highlight some of the challenges of the twinning partnership, including the difficulty of negotiating an exit from a partnership between two very differently resourced organisations and different contexts. You can read more about the twinning partnership and listen to various presentations by me, by Bangladesh Midwifery Society, and indeed by the midwives from Bangladesh and the UK who participated in the partnership on the Royal College of Midwives International Hub. I've put the link here on the slide. You can also just Google RCM International Hub and the links will come up to the presentations and webinars. So in 2023, our organisation engaged the ICM to continue that important work of building BMS's capacity and to build on the foundations, the strong foundations of the RCM's partnership. Actually, ICM had been involved in supporting the development of midwifery in Bangladesh since the very start, but this was the first time they had been a direct in implementing partner with us. So here in this photo, you can see Martha Bacosi, who is the ICM's project manager and is leading the partnership with BMS, with some of the BMS executive board and the young midwives. Uh, and that photo was taken just in December at the annual general meeting. You can see how vibrant and young the midwives are, um, which is wonderful in so many ways. Uh, they have so much energy and enthusiasm, um, but they do need some support and guidance. And many of the executive team are in their early 20s, and this is it's a big step for them. As the evaluation showed, BMS has indeed made uh, enormous progress in the last six years, but it still has many challenges. They currently have no office space, having had to give up their Grace and Faber office recently at a nursing college to make room for more student accommodation. Um, they're trying to find new premises, but at the moment they are a fully virtual organisation with the executive committee scattered across the country. They are struggling to manage all their activities with one only one full-time staff and so developing a proper secretariat is a really important priority as is increasing the membership and retaining the members that they have. Most of you, if you are members of a professional association, and I hope you are, would pay your fees directly uh, from your bank account as an automatic payment and will hardly think about it. But those kind of systems have yet to be developed here. And for some reason, midwives in the humanitarian sector, of which there are many here, have not been prioritising membership of their professional association. 
There are many challenges here in Bangladesh for midwives in their workplaces, and as yet BMS has limited capacity to represent and support its members at a local level. There's still no seat for midwives or for BMS at many of the decision-making tables, and there is a lack of midwifery role models, which leads to a risk of the new generation of midwives repeating some of the negative behaviours that they may have experienced during their educational practice. So this uh, picture at the bottom is Asma. She is the third and current president of the Bangladesh Midwifery Society, the first president to be a midwife. And she leads a executive board, all of whom are midwives, which is, um, has been a really exciting step forward. So the new partnership with ICM will continue to build BMS's organisational capacity, helping BMS to introduce competency-based elections for a new executive board at the end of this year, strengthening advocacy and establishing the organisational systems and structures that they need for effective functioning and growth. The partnership will also focus on developing midwives as leaders and managers with a bespoke Young Midwife Leader Programme and various training initiatives. Bangladesh is a climate vulnerable country, so integrating climate change awareness and training, understanding its impact on sexual and reproductive health and rights, and the role of midwives in responding to climate change is becoming increasingly important. And we're looking to BMS and ICM as they work with them to take a strong lead in that work, the championing midwives as climate change activists. We're very proud to work with these dedicated and inspiring young women, and it's exciting to have the new partnership with ICM and draw on their years of experience in midwifery association strengthening. I just love the matching saris of the executive board of the Bangladesh Midwifery Society. They look so smart and so professional. As I said, I've been here since July 2023, and my role here is to lead nationally our midwifery programmes uh, and have the oversight, not just of our work with the government of Bangladesh, but also with our work in the humanitarian sector. This is a photo of two of our international midwife mentors. Anna and Christine working with our humanitarian team down in Cox's Bazaar, where we support midwives working with approximately a million Rohingya refugees and the host community. And Anna and Christine work across alongside two other international mentors and a team of around 30 national mentors and supervisors. Uh, so I'll be going down next week with Pranita and we'll be working with them and uh, on their strategic planning and various other things. So it's been an absolute joy to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for listening, for your interest in our work, and do get in touch if you'd like any further information. My personal email address is here on the slide, and I wish you a very good evening. Good night. Fantastic. I always love to hear joy and it's, it's a joy to hear joy, but it's also very inspiring to, to hear the whole project. Um, and it's kind of like being at the beginning of something very, very exciting, which really comes through. I mean, I thought it illustrated some, it linked in a lot of it to what Jackie was saying earlier and uh, especially around the model and everything needing to contribute to the whole working of it all. Um, because Joy highlighted the lack of position at a table, at the, the very the powerful table, the, the sort of in charge table, if you like, and the difficulty when you haven't got role models. Because most of us within an established system of midwives have older midwives. Us young, the younger midwives have the older midwives, and they can see leadership in action. 
And this is very much about systems being set up and they have the huge challenges of climate being climate dependent and having humanitarian issues that they've had to manage so well. So thank you to, to Joy. And we haven't Joy here to answer questions. So do take on board her email. She'd be very, very happy to hear from people if you have a particular question or interest, because one of the lovely things, if you're working overseas in, on this sort of project, what is very enjoyable actually is to share what you're doing and discuss it with people who are interested. That's a, that's a real joy. And those of you who've done any project work of any sort will know what a joy that can be. So we, I don't think any question, no question. I look over here because that's where the, the the questions come through from Paul, from all of you. And I guess you might be astounded by by the uh, presentation. So I would just say, would like to say a huge thank you to our guests, to Jackie and to Joy, for sharing some international perspectives and and inspiring us to think of us as a whole, and I'm just going to say sisterhood, because most of us are women, the sisterhood of midwives, us million plus midwives contributing to looking after women, babies and their families all over the world. And we, one of the take home messages, I think for me, is that we need to support each other and we need to link up because I know when Joy was talking about the um, twinning pro process between the RCM and different countries and, and that went on for quite a long time. We can do it on quite a small level if you can reach out to other people. You know, I know students when they go and do their um, electives can go over to a different country or a different place and just make links. And that can be tremendously powerful for both parties. I've worked abroad and I know that I learned quite as much from the people I was working with as I hope they learned from me. So, you know, it's a, it's a very humbling experience. Like I said earlier, we take a lot for granted in, in the UK. And I have to say a big hello which I should have said right at the beginning, and I kind of, kind of slipped my mind, because we've got people from New Zealand, so hello to New Zealand, from the USA, from Ghana and Ethiopia, as, men, as well as many others from all over the world. Welcome to you. I hope you've enjoyed this and found it useful and interesting for your practice and for whatever you're doing. So a big thank you to Jackie and Joy. I also want to say a big thank you to Angelo, who's behind the scenes, making sure everything's recorded. So if you want to share this with colleagues, of, when you'll get a link and you can share it with your colleagues. And that can be quite good. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, because sharing with your colleagues gives you a discussion. You can sometimes identify things that maybe you can change, maybe you can bring in from the discussions this evening into your own practice. And that can be tremendously interesting and helpful for cementing it in your brain, but also moving practice forward, making things better for women and their babies, making things better for midwives all over the world. We need to support each other. So resources are going to be available on the website and on Facebook on Friday. And also those of you who like um, the six o'clock in the morning podcast that'll be available six o'clock in the morning on Friday for those of you who want to be maybe doing listening as you're running that'd be fantastic or whatever you if you're in the car whatever now next week we've got uh, an ABC of preeclampsia and we've got Dr Erin Khan and Dr Zhu Chong um, and they're being supported by APEC, which is a very important organisation, huge source of information for women and families and for midwives and other professionals engaged in maternity services where preeclampsia might be an issue. Fantastic. So I hope to see lots of you next week. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Thank you very much for coming along this evening and see you next week. I hope. Take care. <laughs>